Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. In just a few moments, Dr. Dale Adkins is going to come open the Word and present Bible truths. Let me take just a moment and share a couple things about Dr. Adkins. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. It is right for me to take a few moments and just honor Dr. Adkins. He has been a senior pastor for many years. The Lord used him at a wonderfully thriving church in Ohio, where he served as the senior pastor for a number of years. And then it's been almost 10 years ago that the Lord directed he and his wife to serve on the staff at Pensacola Christian College. And then he became wonderfully involved in the work of Campus Church. He continues to serve on the staff at Pensacola Christian, and he serves the student body, he serves faculty and staff, and he serves churches beyond the realm of Pensacola Christian College. I'm so grateful for not only a man that I consider to be a personal friend, I'm thankful for a resource. And when I say that, I mean a person that I can go to and seek counsel, say, hey, do you have some thoughts on this? I need some direction about. And I'm also very thankful for a person that I can say, would you consider preaching for us at Campus Church? And Dr. Adkins has always so graciously agreed to step in and every time he does, he has something relevant, insightful, valuable for us to hear. Today's no exception. In just a few moments, you're going to hear a message that quite honestly, it's the first time I've ever heard this parallel made in scripture. And when I heard him preach it, I thought, wow, what a wonderful truth and what a great comparison. We're gonna hear about a man who quite honestly had no hope at a time in, in, in Bible times when there really weren't any answers. A man whose name is Naaman, who was a leper. And then Dr. Adkins is going to draw a parallel from a New Testament Bible character. Another man who, apart from Jesus Christ, had literally no hope. His name is Nicodemus. We're going to see how Naaman and Nicodemus both come together in the pages of Scripture in ways that are not only important for those men, they are important for people today, people just like you, people just like me. It is an honor to be able to present to you, to Campus Church and to those who have joined us by way of Rejoice in the Lord, the preaching ministry of Dr. Dale Adkins. I trust that this message will not only be a blessing, but an honest help as we together gather around the word and see Bible truths that meet us where we are today. In just a few moments, the preaching ministry of Dr. Dale Adkins. Let's take our Bibles this morning, if you would please, and we'll find our way to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, the book of 2 Kings in chapter number five. The Bible says, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress in verse number three, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. 
And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, in verse number 8, that when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha, in verse number 10, sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought that he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Ebana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Second King chapter 5 gives us a great Old Testament illustration of the cleansing of a sinner. Now I remind you that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 11, in speaking about Israel, the Bible tells us now all these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. We know that the principles, the truths, the pictures, the illustrations of the Old Testament are for our learning. But now let me warn you about something that I think you're probably aware of. Before we go wild on any picture or illustration of the Old Testament and begin to draw all kinds of spiritual lessons from it, there ought to be a New Testament confirmation of that principle as well. And I think we have one here for 2 Kings chapter 5 when we think about Nicodemus in John chapter 3. As we proceed our way through this message this morning, I'm going to show you a few little uh, comparisons uh, between Nicodemus and this man Naaman that perhaps God can use to instruct us and help us to better grasp exactly what's happening here. Would you just consider just a few simple things from the verses that we've read? First of all, in verse number one, let's talk about the mighty Naaman. There's several things about this man that become obvious to us right away. The scripture teaches us he had position. He says he was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. He had the respect and the admiration of his superiors. It says he was a great man with his master. He had character. He said he was an honorable man. Strangely, though he was a heathen, in some way, in some fashion, he'd actually been used of God. That, that was not unusual. You know that God used Pharaoh. We know God used Nebuchadnezzar. But somewhere along the line, he had used this man Naaman to deliver Syria for whatever reason happened to be in the sovereignty of God. We know also that he was evidently a brave man. The Bible tells us in verse number one that he was a mighty man in valor. But that very last phrase is what really defines him at this time. Because the Bible says, but he was a leper. Now, I think you are familiar with leprosy. We know in the Old Testament that leprosy is a, a fatal disease that really had no cure. But we know also that oftentimes it was used of God as an illustration for sin. Leprosy was a disease that, that uh, went deeper than the skin. It spread rapidly. It defiled and isolated. It destroyed slowly. Again, it was a type of sin in the Bible. Now, it may have been that Naaman only had one spot of leprosy on him. Did you notice in verse number 11 where we read a moment ago when he was talking about what he thought Elisha, Elisha would do, he said he would come out and strike his hand over the place. It may have been that the leprosy he had was just small. It may have been on an arm or, or perhaps on one of his legs. It, it might, might have been on his body somewhere, not even visible to anyone else around him. But it was there and it was slowly slowly destroying him. And he knew, and the king of Syria knew, and all around him knew that if something was not done, 
that Naaman would die of leprosy. In John chapter 3, in the story of this man Nicodemus, he was much like this. The Bible tells us he was a good man. He was a, 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 a ruler of the, of the Jews. We know that he was a Pharisee. We, we know that he was a polite man. He came to Jesus in a very polite way. He had character. He had religion. He had all those things going for him. And yet, the only thing that Jesus said to him after Nicodemus introduced himself was this. Ye must be born again. I suppose this morning that many of us know people like that, don't we? We know people who are, are good neighbors. We know folks who are good citizens. They're good friends of ours. We know folks who are, are very religious but the bottom line is, with all that they've got going for them, they do not know the Lord. And may I just remind you this morning that, sadly, oftentimes what appears to be their greatest assets become the greatest hindrances to coming to God. Sometimes our position, sometimes our, the way we are recognized, sometimes the honor that we have received, regardless of who the person may be, and regardless how humble we may be in other ways, when it comes to this spiritual matter, oftentimes we let the applause or the recognition of men and the teachings of religion blind our eyes to what our need really is. The mighty Naaman. But he was a leper. I want you to consider something else. In verse number 2 and verse number 3, let's talk just for a moment about this merciful little maid. Now, the whole record that's given to us here would not be here. It would not be of any help. Naaman would have never found the, a, the source of help for his need if it had not been for this little Jewish captive. Unnamed and yet faithful. I think her words show us some very important things about her. I think, first of all, we can learn that she evidently had been brought upright. She was away from home. She was not now living with her parents. She had been violently taken away from that, that situation. And yet, even though she had been cruelly removed from her environment, she still stood for God. She must have had a good testimony in the household, don't you think? Or why would they even have paid any? Who cared what a little servant girl said? Who cares what a little servant girl comment she has to make? And yet for whatever reason, those that heard her responded immediately to what she said. That's because she'd been brought up right. I think you also would agree with me that she had real compassion. She had compassion for those who were suffering, even if those who were suffering were the ones that were the source of her suffering. If it was even the one that had taken her out of her home, the one that had brought her to a foreign land, the one that had brought her to a place of servitude. But she had compassion. And I think also you would notice that she had an unshakable faith. Even in her predicament that she was in, she was not blaming God for what had happened. She was not declaring that she had no use for God or the things of God. But she was still very much interested in God and the way he worked. And I find it interesting what she said that the man of God could do for this man Naaman was evidently something that she had never seen before. You say, preacher, why would you say that? In the New Testament, in the book of Luke chapter 4, in verse number 27, the Lord Jesus, in talking about the circumstances of, the, of, of that day, said this. He said, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of, of Elisha. But none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. There were many lepers in that part of the world, but only one was cleansed, and that was Naaman the leper. Now, does that mean that she had never seen God? You don't realize that today, most of us want our faith to rest in what we've seen. Is that not true? We're kind of like the devil when he was tempting the Lord, you know, there on the mount. He, he said, uh, you know, uh, do these things and, and then we'll believe. Show that you're God. Demonstrate to us. Show us something. And yet the Bible teaches us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you remember Thomas? When he came to Jesus and, and uh, he said, well, I, I'm not going to believe unless I, I see the wounds in his hands and I see the spear print in his side. I'm not going to believe. And then after he saw him, after Jesus appeared to Thomas, you remember Thomas cried out and said, my Lord, my God. But do you recall what Jesus said to him in response to that? In John chapter 20 and verse number 29, Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Again, faith is trusting God without having seen 
And that's exactly evidently the kind of faith that this little maid had. She'd never seen. It wasn't like Elisha was going around healing a leper every day. It wasn't like she'd seen him do it hundreds and hundreds. Of, oh, I've seen him do this many times before. No, she'd never seen it probably. But she knew that the man of God and the God of that man could do anything. That's faith. That's faith. Let me give you something to think about, not only about Naaman and about the little maid, but let's also think for just a moment about the misguided king. What a, what a and, and I hate to say humorous, but it is in a way humorous story that the, the scripture relate to us. The king of Syria and Naaman decide that they're going to try out what the maid had suggested. They're going to go down to Israel to find help. But of course, they added their own little interpretation to it like we always do. And so they sent a letter from one king to another and they, they sent enough money to try and buy his cleansing. Can I just stop right here and say right here, I think we begin to see a clear picture of the barrier to God that was in this man's life. The same barrier that's in many of our lives. Our pride. It rubbed these proud Syrians the wrong way to think that they might have to deal with some lowly prophet. They were going to deal with the king. They weren't going to deal with some prophet. And aren't we oftentimes the very same way? Our pride blinds us to what our needs really are and our willingness to obey God and to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. In verse number seven, Naaman quickly found out that someone who doesn't know God, regardless of who they are, is just as confused as they were about what was going on. Remember that Nicodemus was a religious leader of his people. And yet when Jesus said, you must be born again, he was totally in the dark. He said, how, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, the re religions of this world have answers for a lot of things. The religions of this world can tell you how to deal with anxiety. The religions of this world can perhaps tell you how to be a good neighbor. The religions of this world may tell you how to uh, have financial success in this, in, in, in this world we live in. But when you ask the question, how can a man know that his sins are forgiven and that heaven is his home? The religions of this world have to bow their head and say, I don't have any idea. I have no idea. I have no idea what to do. I'm simply saying to you that the greatest truth is never found in the teachings of this world. The greatest truths are, are never revealed to us through the wisdom of men or through the exchanges of governments. The greatest truths are revealed to us through the Word of God. Hallelujah. Look, if you will, in verse 8 through verse number 12, the Bible tells us about the message from God. In verse number 8, Elisha sends for Naaman, tells him to come down where he is. Naaman, of course, goes. Can you see that, that great uh, entourage as they move off down that old dusty road towards the house where the prophet lived? the chariots and the horses, and they pull up out front. And someone announces to Elisha that Naaman, the mighty general of Syria, has arrived. And the Bible said that Elisha doesn't even go out himself. He sends a servant. You see, Elisha knew what he was dealing with. He knew that he was dealing with a man whose heart was full of pride and full of self and full of rebellion. So the Bible said he sent a servant out. He said, go tell him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. Again, we've already mentioned, you remember what the Lord said to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, ye must be born again. The first birth that you had is not going to do it. The only way, the only way, Nicodemus, that you're going to have your sin forgiven and to be made a citizen of heaven is by being born again again it's interesting to compare chapter 5 and verse number 10 here of our text in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13 the Bible says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved did you notice that the, the means of cleansing was within easy reach all Naaman had to do was go down the Jordan dip seven times all we have to do is call in faith upon the name of the Lord. The promise was sure in both cases. Naaman, thou shalt be clean. And sinner, thou shalt be saved. But unfortunately, 
Again, Naaman's pride gets in the way. He declares in verse number 11, I thought. (laughs) And how many over the years have stumbled at that place? I thought. Here's what I thought you would do. They will not acknowledge their sinfulness. They have their own ideas. They believe they're just as valid as God's. Naaman said, how come I can't go down to to Syria? There's some clean rivers down there. I I could dip in them. And and why can't I do that instead of having to go down that muddy Jordan? And oftentimes they're looking for a religious show, aren't they? Naaman was disappointed that Elisha didn't come out and put on some kind of show. He said in verse number 11, I, I thought he'd come out surely to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place, recover the leper. I thought it'd be a show we're seeing. You know, we could sell tickets. But again, Elisha didn't even come out where he was. You know, please remember this. No matter how closely our ways may resemble God's ways, unless it is exactly as thus saith the Lord, it won't get the job done. Someone made the comment that you can go to heaven God's way or you can go to hell your way. And that's pretty much the bottom line, isn't it? We can either do it God's way. We can acknowledge that I thought means nothing. We can acknowledge that our way is the empty way. We can acknowledge that what we think doesn't matter. And we can bow before Almighty God. Say, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I'm going to come your way. I'm going to put my trust in you. In Naaman's case, I'm going to go down to the Jordan and I'm going to dip there. And that brings us, of course, in verse 13 and verse 14 to the melting of a proud heart. We don't have any names for these servants, just like we didn't have a name for the little maid. (laughs) But thank the Lord for their common sense. Such a rare commodity, is it not? Just common sense. It took a lot of courage, no doubt, for them to approach Naaman and to speak to their insulted, enraged master. But they loved him enough to do it. And I'm glad they did. You know, the Bible reminds us that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. They truly loved Naaman because they were willing to wound him for his own benefit. The Bible said that their simple words of encouragement to why not do it? You would do it. If he had asked you to do some great thing, you would have done it. Why not do what the prophet said? The Bible records in verse number 14, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Wow. What an amazing statement. And he was clean. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I wonder how many this morning could stand and give a testimony that there was a day in your life, just like this day in Naaman's life, when you were a leper, sin had eaten away at your life, and you'd rebelled against God and the things of God, and you thought... You had an idea about things. You, you thought the way things should be, but God brought you to that place. He broke you down. He made you understand there was only one way. And you bowed that proud heart and that proud head. You cried out to God and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. You went down once. And you went down twice. And three and four and five and six. And you went down that seventh time. And when you raised your head up, you said... My faith is in Christ and in Christ alone. And you were clean. (laughs) And you were clean. You know, it's a funny, he goes from verse number 11 where he says, I thought, to verse number 15, he says, now I know. Wow, what what a marvelous journey to make. From I thought, my ways, to now I know that there is no other God but this God. You know, in John chapter 3, the Bible does not record for us exactly what happened in the life of Nicodemus. We know he came. We know he was confronted by the Lord. We know they had that very famous uh, interview that took place. But the Bible doesn't record at the end of that what happened to Nicodemus. 
You have to go farther in the, in the Gospel of John to find that out. You go to chapter number 19, after the crucifixion of our Lord. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea comes to ask Pilate. The Bible said he was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. But he comes to Pilate to ask for the body of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that when he comes, there's someone who's with him. And the man that is with him is a fellow by the name of Nicodemus. And the Bible expressly says it was that Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. He'd been made clean. He'd been made clean. And now he came to join Joseph in asking for the body of the Lord. Folks, listen to me this morning. I realize that on a Sunday like this, and probably a large majority of the people that are sitting in this room know what it is to have your sin forgiven, to know that heaven is your home. But there may be someone sitting here this morning that is still struggling with that I thought. I thought. I thought I could do it my way. I thought I could do what I wanted to do. And to this point, you haven't really come yet to that place of breaking. May the Holy Spirit of God this morning make it so real to you. It doesn't matter what I think or what you think. What matters is thus saith the Lord. And the Bible says that except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There is an old poem that was written years ago. It was ultimately, I think, made into a song. But I want you to listen to the words of it. The Bible says, dark the stain that soil man's nature, long the distance that he fell, far removed from hope and heaven into deep despair and hell. But there was a fountain opened and the blood of God's own son purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon his throne and I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Some of you might be like Naaman this morning. And the stain reaches all the way to the bone. That's what leprosy was. But thank God, the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. God's grace is sufficient whoever you are, and wherever you've been. Would you first of all think this morning about this man Naaman, and even this man Nicodemus, both of them similar in their character, both of them having the same need, and God was able to meet it. He can meet that need in your life today. It may be today that some of you have found a common spirit with that little maid or with those servants, and you're just someone trying to do the best you can but realize again, God wants to use you and He will. He will. If you'll make yourself useful. May God help us this morning to just let Him have His way in our life. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.